Good morning, St. Andrew's family. Thanks for joining us in worship. We understand that we've been having a few technical difficulties this morning, so thanks for being patient and waiting around to be with us in worship this morning. We're going to get started. I hope that you guys will be able to just push away all the distractions that you might have this morning, and let's just focus all of our attention and affection on God this morning. <laughs>
so excited. Today is Youth Sunday, so you're going to see a lot of youth stuff going on. We're featuring our youth today. So, so um, we have Rachel Grafton, who we are so excited to have on staff with us uh, now. She's, she's newly a staff member. So I'll let you tell her a little bit about yourself and uh, intro the youth stuff for us this morning. Thank you, Alyssa, and good morning, St. Andrews. We are so happy you're joining us here, um, and I'm so excited to um, have it be you Sunday today. They have spent a lot of time and effort in creating a beautiful and inspired worship experience for you. Um, if you could just take a quick minute and let us know you're here this morning by filling out a Connect card. Please use only one name in the first and last name fields, and you'll have an opportunity later on in the forum to... Um, include the rest of your household members. We'd also love for you to um, share any prayer requests you have for us this morning. Um, we would love the opportunity for our church to pray for you. We also have some very exciting news to share with you. Our task force and church council committees have decided to move to phase one of our reopening plan in September. We will hold our first in-person worship service on September 20th. We'll be sending out more info this week with all the details. We know it's going to look a little bit different, but we are so excited to have the opportunity to regather again in person. Now let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship while our youth um, have created a special song for you to enjoy, Deep Cries Out.
Thank you, youth, for that awesome video. It looks like you guys had a lot of fun. We're going to continue. It's awesome to see the youth learning some of this music and being able to worship in their fun, exciting way. So we're going to continue in that worship this morning.
we're going to move now into a, a time of prayer. It was a tough week. And so it's really exciting to me that we can focus on the youth of this church. You know, the, the heart of any church are the children in its youth. The t-shirt that I'm wearing that, that Rachel and then Gary you'll see on him says that socially distanced, spiritually connected, fall 2020. It's not the way any of us wanted to be this fall. Tonight, our youth will kick off with their um, with a, a socially distant a, a, um, a online a, a, a celebration. It's not how they wanted to do it this year. And they all received this t-shirt this past week and they got a tie-dye kit with it to, to do their t-shirts for tonight. These are wonderful attempts to remind everybody we're still connected. But as I said, this was a tough week. Hurricane Laura took lives and devastated people. People who won't have the money to replace what has been lost. COVID continues its rampage, taking lives. And we as a country are so politically divided right now. But we're not politically divided about um, light issues. We're politically divided about things that hurt people. Hurts that go to the very core of who we are as human beings. Things are said and people are feeling things that will impact them the rest of their lives. We are a country in need of healing. And as Christians, we need to be reminded that we are spiritually connected. Regardless of what side we will vote on in November, regardless of where we land on any issue, we are spiritually connected by one God, one spirit. And so as we pray today, let's pray for each other. Let's pray for the healing of our country. Let's pray for the healing of our world. We are so in need of God's touch. I want us to begin with just a moment of some silent prayer. And as we do, if you're not quite sure how to pray, I want to offer to you what I use when I meditate. I simply pause and say, be still and know I am God. If you're not sure how to pray, if you don't know the answer, if you feel a bit hopeless about life right now, just say that a couple times silently. Be still and know that I'm God. Let's begin with some silent prayer. Loving God, what a relief it is to come to you, to lay out our thoughts, our frustrations, our hurt, our disappointment, to lay out our fear, our anxiety. There's so much to worry about. And yet still, you are God. You are God. That is the hope of today. That is the thing we need to remember, that you are God. God. And all of these issues that feel so uh, huge and looming and scary, and there doesn't seem to be any foreseeable answer. When we know hearts are broken and people are in despair, feeling that we can never be a country fully healed, we come to you and remember you are God. And you connect us by a spirit that is so great and so powerful that you can literally change our hearts. You can literally change our thoughts. That you can turn hard hearts into love and that you can give us the capacity to forgive, to forget, and to move forward and to love our neighbor. That by your spirit, we can do what feels impossible in our own strength. But by your spirit, we can love everyone around us. We thank you for that one spirit that connects us. And we thank you that that one spirit draws us back into your loving arms. 
where you accept us in all of our brokenness, where you accept us in all of the challenges of our lives, where you accept us basically as who we are today, totally getting us, totally understanding our history, our experiences, and why we land where we land. You get that about us, and you love us, and you don't give up on us, and you continue to transform our hearts. Father God, for me, I think if you can transform my heart, you can transform the hearts of everybody. I know I can feel very hard-hearted at times, but loving God, our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is in you. And so we thank you and we praise you. And together we pray as a congregation the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Jane was saying was perfect, but it's called legacy. And I know for me personally, I always try to be the light, to be the person that in my family, in my community, to my children, at my workplace, that people look at me and they're like, she's different. And so I, I feel like that's something that as Christians, we, sh we should strive to be that we should be the one person that they can look at and, and they notice that there's something different about us. And I think sometimes we don't realize how many lives we can affect by things that we say and things that we do that maybe when we feel like no one's really watching us, but there are always people watching us. So I hope this song is just a reminder to you that we are leaving a legacy. Whether we want to or not, whether we realize it or not, people are watching us and they're watching what we do and they're watching how we act and how we respond and what we say. So for me, this was a great reminder that I just need to continue trying to be that light that God has made me to be. I don't mind if you've got something nice to say about me. I enjoy an accolade just like the rest. And you could take my picture and hang it in a gallery with all the who's and who's and so-and-so's that used to be the best at such and such. It wouldn't matter much. I won't lie. The temporary trappings of this world. I want to leave a legacy. How will they remember me? Did I choose to love? Or did I point to you enough to make a mark on things? I want to leave an offering. A child of mercy and grace. Who blessed your name? Unapologetic.
to do or well bread I just want to hear instead well done good and faithful one oh, oh, oh. I want to leave a legacy how will they to say about me Matthew 13 1 through 9 that day Jesus went out of the house and sat down beside the lake such large crowds gathered around him that he climbed into a boat and sat down. The whole crowd was standing on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his fields, some seeds fell into a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seeds fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked them. Other seeds fell on a good soil and bore fruit. In one case, a yield of 100 to 1. In a case, a yield 60 to 1. And in another case, a yield of 30 to 1. Everyone who has ears should pay attention. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. We were kind of scrambling around this morning. We didn't have, when we came in, we didn't have internet here at the church. But uh, thanks to uh, some miracle work by Ryan up in the sound booth, we do have, uh, uh, we do have internet. We can be able to live stream today a little bit late. But uh, it was, we were all kind of scrambling around and, and disconnected and, and we are just uh, had other things on our mind. But just being here and listening to, being absorbed in the praise music and seeing the energy of the youth and the, being a time of prayer and we're spiritually connected again. We are in sync with, with God, where God is. So I am glad that we are here today to celebrate uh, this Sunday, especially Youth Sunday. And that this parable that was, that was just read to you, I, I, it's known as the parable of the soil or the parable of the sower. And I have a special connection with it. See, I, I kind of lived on a farm. Uh, I know, I, let me explain what I mean by that. My grandfather was a farmer. He lived next door to us. My grandparents lived next door to us. Um, and, and so we said, he had grew so, corn and soybeans. And since they lived next door to us, I lived on the land. I lived on a farm, but it's not what you think a farm is. We didn't have acres and acres of land around us. There weren't uh, uh, cattle and cows and chickens on the property. We actually lived in the city limits of the town of Evansville. And you wouldn't even know that my grandfather was a farmer unless you looked in the back shed and you saw that there's farm equipment and tractors back there. He actually had to drive about 20 minutes to get to his farmland. My grandfather's farmland was right on the banks of the Ohio River. It was prime farmland. Everybody wanted that farmland because being on the banks of the river, as he called the river bottoms, uh, it was filled with all kind of natural nutrients that we absorbed into the soil when during the off season, the, the river would overflow and spread out all over his land. 
However, it also meant he was, it was prone to occasional flooding. There was a levee, but the levee protected the city, the towns and the homes and the residences. His land was in between the river and the levee. So I can understand the connection of the people of the biblical times. As, as my grandfather's land was unprotected uh, by rising waters, I can understand uh, the connection with this parable. Growing crops was their livelihood. They were not only talking, they were just not talking about tomato plants in the backyard, in their garden, not at all. In many cases, the success of the crop of any year determined sometimes whether they lived or died. And the one factor that was enormously determinant of the crop success was something they had no control over, the weather. The weather conditions seemed to be so arbitrary. It would vary from year to year, and, and, and you never knew what was going, to, was going to happen. The people of the New Testament, they needed to lean on a force beyond themselves through the unpredictability of the seasons. Sometimes it was idols. Sometimes it was nature worship. But those who were faithful depended totally on God for they were powerless in controlling the one thing that was literally a matter of life and death to them. With my grandfather, it wasn't really a matter of life and death, but the weather was still ever present on his mind. Um, something he had no dominion over. It was, he was at the mercy of weather. And as I read scripture that are filled with agricultural images and farming illustrations, I, I can relate watching my grandfather's struggles on his farm. When the Bible refers to life as a river flowing, I can understand for the river was truly a pervasive reality that flowed through his life. His livelihood depended on that river. There were years that, that after he had already planted and plowed the ground, heavy rain caused the river to overflow and flood his land, ruining the crop. I remember driving with my grandfather in his pickup to see firsthand the flooding damage. Drove the Chevy to the levee. Some of you will get that uh, reference. But in this case, the levee wasn't dry. He would just stare out all the immense amount of water and just silently shake his head. All that work of planting, the seed was all wasted. He'd have to start all over again. So Jesus had a captive audience as he shared this parable of, of, the, of the, the, the seeds and the soil. Planting, growing, harvesting crops was so, for many, their whole life. It was their life. And determined whether they survived or not. Jesus spoke this parable to them and he hit a nerve. He got their attention. He addressing the biggest concern that they faced in their lives. Will they have a good crop this year to feed the family so they could live and thrive for another day? He tells of a farmer who went out to scatter seed on his land. Some fell on the path. The, the path was, the ground was so hard. It was too hard for the seed to take root. So the birds came and ate it. Some seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was very shallow. And producing a plant that sprung up quickly, but because the soil wasn't deep, the sun came out and scorched the plants. They withered up and died. Some seed fell among thorny plants or the weeds. The weeds grew up around the plants, they choked them, and the plants died. Ultimately, some seed fell on good soil and bore an immensely great harvest, so great that it could not be sufficiently measured. Once again, I can relate to this story. For a few summers, when I was a young teenage boy, I, I worked at my grandfather's farm uh, chopping down weeds. I got a dollar an hour, and I thought I was rich. You know, of all the technological advances in farming that have been made over the years, there's one real, no real high-tech way of, of cutting weeds. You have to do it by hand. You have to pull them up by hand. So along with my brother and a group of our friends, we spent part of the summer walking through the rows of corn and chopping down the weeds or pulling them up by hand. I'm sure a lot of you out there have had some interesting summer jobs, so why don't you share that on the chat space right now? What summer jobs did you have as a youth? As I look back and I think about how a group of young teenage boys each would be given a two and a half foot long sharp machete and let loose on the farmland, and I'm thinking, what was my grandfather thinking? He only had to make one hospital run that I could think of, and it wasn't me. 
as we walked through the fields, there would be stretches of land with no crop on it at all. The ground was too hard, and the soil wasn't that fertile. There were stretches of land that were just filled with weeds, and we tried our best to chop away and pull up the roots to get them away from the crop. And I remember there'd be stretches they were so filled with weeds that my grandfather would just say, don't even worry about that. They're too far gone. Yet there would be stretches of field that were just beautiful, beautiful green budding corn husk that was a marvel to see, and I still remember that smell. And you wonder why that soil was so different that produced such a great crop as compared to the other part. It just didn't seem to make sense. There was no rational explanation. What is so interesting about this parable is that, actually, unless I'm mistaken, it's the only one that Jesus actually explains. He explains it later, the meaning of it. You know, Jesus liked to speak in parables and to drive a point across without actually spelling out its meaning. By telling a parable, Jesus wanted his hearers as well as, well as us to put ourselves in the story so we can not only grasp his point intellectually, but live it out, experience its reality in our story. However, some, for some reason, Jesus decided to explain this parable. So here's the explanation that's listed later in the 13th chapter of Matthew, starting with verse 18. Consider then the parable of the farmer. Whenever people hear the word about the kingdom and don't understand it, the evil one comes and carries off what was planted in their hearts. This is the seed that was sown on the path. As for the seed that was spread on rocky ground, this refers to people who hear the word and immediately receive it joyfully. Because they have no roots, they last for only a little while. When they experience distress or abuse because of the world, they immediately fall away. As for the seed that was spread among thorny plants, this refers to those who hear the word, but the worries of this life and the false appeal of wealth choke the word and it bears no fruit. As for what was planted on good soil, this refers to those who hear and understand and bear fruit and produce. In one case, a yield of 100 to 1. In another case, a yield of 60 to 1. In another case, a yield of 30 to 1. The seed, as Jesus is referring to, the seed is the message of God. The message of God's mercy, grace, and love. The word of God. Many hear the message, but responses to the message are as varied as those seeds in the field. Each of the four conditions of the seeds and soil described in the parable corresponds to the way an individual responds to hearing about that message and how each response has its consequences. The seeds that are eaten by, from the path by birds corresponds to the response of anyone hearing but not understanding the word of God. The consequences is that they are helpless. They are helpless to evil. They are helpless to the evil one. And then Jesus goes on to graphically describe how the evil one snatches away something that has already been sown in the heart. The seeds that grow and die quickly on rocky ground correspond to those who respond with great enthusiasm upon hearing the word of the kingdom of God. Yet they immediately receive it with joy, yet soon fall away. Those persons possess initial excitement, yet when faced with trials and tribulations in this world, they're not sufficiently grounded in a foundation that can hold a more lasting commitment. The Greek used in this passage for fall away can be translated as losing confidence or losing trust. The condition of the seeds among the thorns correspond to those who don't even get a chance to respond to the hearing of the word of God because the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word thus suppressing any opportunity of a response in the first place. The result is that there's no spiritual growth whatsoever. It truly is they are enclosed in a crowd to the point of suffocation, to the point that they can't even act at all in receiving the message of God. Yet the seed in the good soil describes the one who hears the word and understands it, which results in an abundantly fruitful action, pretty straightforward, as Jesus said. But what is exactly hearing and understanding? First, we must be receptive to hear, be alert and hear. And that's sometimes difficult in itself. With all that's going on in the world today, with all the influence that are trying to vie for our attention, hearing no longer is as simple as it appears. Even Jesus must iterate that at the end of the parable when he says, 
everyone who has ears should pay attention. That's from the uh, Common English Bible translation. I like that one. He gets right to the point. He holds, doesn't hold back any points. You got to pay attention. You know, it's a type of hearing or paying attention that leads to understanding. If you're going to understand, you need to listen, and that's what Jesus is saying. And it's a type of understanding that's not in order to make sense of what is being said. To understand in order to make sense of God's purpose in our lives so that we can bear impressive fruits, yields of fruit, and producing of what God's intent is for this world. One filled with love and mercy as we live into the salvation and forgiveness that God offers us freely through his unmerited grace. Today is Youth Sunday. Got my youth, youth, youth shirt on here. It's a time when we lift up the contributions and the gifts of the youth in our church. The youth of this church have had their own particular struggles during this pandemic. They have not been able to meet together in person. They were deprived of the normal end of the school year activities and celebrations of the past school year and now trying to navigate a new school year filled with a great deal of uncertainty and apprehension. It's as if they don't, they're not able to live a normal middle schooler or high schooler life. It's tough enough, as many as you remember, going through those years as a youth. But now you have the difficulties of the COVID crisis. Talk about being surrounded by weeds. And I can attest that the youth of today have much more distractions, a variety of things that are vying for their attention than I had when I was a youth. That's why the message of God's love, mercy, and grace is ever so needed today. I remember youth leaders in my church as I was growing up that mentored me and nurtured me in the hearing and understanding of God's message of love so I could live it out in my teen years. It was Mrs. Turpin and Mr. Hinton. They, those that were beyond my family that volunteered their time to reach out to me and show me the example of Christ's love in my life. And I'm sure there's adults out there, uh, there, there are uh, adults out there that, that when, when you were a youth that helped you and mentored you during that time, why don't you mention some of those in a chat space right now? They were very important to me in my life, and I've actually tried to go back and thank them as many as I can find, but what were the names of the church volunteers that mentored you in your youth? And it's appropriate that on this Youth Sunday, I'm preaching on this parable, the parable of the soil. For there is not a more fertile soil upon which to share the message of God's love and his kingdom than with youth. It's been shown that there is no more vital time in a person's life to hear and accept Christ than during youth. Once one gets beyond their youth years, it becomes harder and harder to hear and accept that message, to live it out in their lives, to continue it on. But there's another way to look at this parable. You may have noticed at the beginning of the sermon, I said I gave two titles for this parables. There was the parable of the soils and the parable of the sower. And it depends on what the emphasis is. It's the same parable, but different emphasis. So far, we've been concentrating on the soils. Now let's focus on the sower, the farmer who's scattering the seeds. And it goes without saying that that sower is God in this parable. God is an extravagant sower of the seed, spreading, scattering the seed, spreading his message of love and salvation and grace, scattering to all. And it's interesting, even back in the New Testament times, a farmer would not plant seed by flinging it haphazardly across the field like this farmer did. That would be foolish. Yet God, the sower of his message, we see him lavishly liberally, freely, generously spreading his message to all through his son, Jesus Christ. So looking at the parable in this way, we see a loving God who sends his son to spread the message of his kingdom, the message of God, and does so plentifully, lavishly, even to, the, to those who don't earn it are judged worthy to receive it. There's plenty of seed to go around. And to spread such valuable seed around without knowing if it's going to take root seems foolish to us, but not in God's economy. No matter how much seed may seem to be wasted, in the end, a great harvest is sure. Even when nothing seems to be happening, we mustn't get discouraged. The farmer in this parable seems to appear to only scatter the seed once. 
However, picture this from God's perspective. God is constantly flinging seed all the time, every day to everyone without hesitating. You can even say that every moment in our life is a seed. Every seed may not take root, but that doesn't concern God. God is willing to take that risk out of his great love for us, for God knows that the harvest is great. It says in scripture that the seed will produce a great harvest, 30, 60, 100 times than what was sown. That is ludicrous. A good crop back in those days would produce 10 times what is sown. That's a good year. But 30, 60, 100 times? That's ridiculous. But not in God's economy. We could learn a lot from the youth of this generation. They have seen rocky soils and their life is filled with weeds of distraction in their lives. You know, their elementary years, their toddler years, they grew up in the aftermath of 9-11. And now when they should be the most active in their lives, time of their lives, they've been stuck at home during this COVID pandemic. They're living at the forefront of issues of justice and mercy in our world. Yet can you imagine what fruit will be born out from this generation? Stronger, more resilient, more dependent and trusting in their faith of God yet still able to express joy and celebrate into being downright silly, as we've seen from those videos this morning. We all need a dose of that in our lives. We as a church need to nurture this fertile soil. There's opportunities uh, for, to volunteer in youth ministry because you can be one of those youth ministers, those mentors that can help a youth as so many helped me. And believe it or not, they can nurture you too, mentor you. And we just might have to change, modify this parable to describe a harvest that is 100, 200, 500 times more than what was sown. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you've given us this parable to show how a, a, a loving God you are, that you spread that love uh, to all, even though we don't earn it or deserve it. And Lord, we just thank you for the youth here today that are able to receive the message of God, to be able to be examples of living it out in their lives. And Lord, let it, that these seeds take fruit. Let it take in a fertile soil and bear an amazing amount of fruit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We speak your name, we lift our eyes, tune our hearts into your beat. Where we walk, there you'll be, with fire in our eyes, a life's a light, your love untamed, it's blazing out the street. I started coming to youth because my parents forced me, but as I've come, I've grown to love it, and it's been a second home because everyone is so sweet and kind. They've helped me grow in spiritually and in relationships with everyone. Throughout the years, I've met so many people that I'm glad to call my friends and some even family.
different opportunities through the program. Uh, one, one of my favorite parts about the youth group is just the community. Uh, we all have fun together and it's really great to have a community of fellow Christians. Our youth ministry is near and dear to our hearts. And uh, like Pastor Jane said, uh, though we may be gathering separate, we are still spiritually connected and there is still good work being done in youth ministry and pouring into our youth at St. Andrews. If you feel led to give this morning, there's a giving link in the trash screen or you can mail a check to St. Andrews. Thank you again, St. Andrews, for your unwavering faith and your willingness to lead people to know God and experience his grace through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. You. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. Amen. Amen. i 
thousand generations in your families and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your families and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your families and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you
to everything